quantum. Everywhere we go, we see the word quantum. There seems to be a constant bombardment of the word quantum in our everyday life. There was this one day when I was just going to the movies, so there I was watching Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, and all of a sudden, there's this thing called the Quantum Asteroid Belt. Well, it's supposed to be some sort of area where asteroids appear and disappear randomly. Okay, weird. And then a couple of years ago, I was just watching Avengers Endgame, and apparently quantum physics solves time travel now. You know, basically my feeling about the entire Marvel franchise can be summarized by this video. Quantum realm. Quantum technology. Quantum anomaly. Quantum phase. Quantum spectrometer. Quantum system. Quantum energy. Quantum research. Quantum void. Quantum entanglement between the quantum states. Quantum healing particles. Do you guys just put the word quantum in front of everything? Hey. Yep, that's exactly how I feel. But do you think you are free just because you are not watching a movie? No. If you're watching television, for example, in Doctor Who, there's this quantum locking in the Weeping Angels episode. Or if you are playing computer games, there's this whole multiverse thing that goes on which is supposed to be based on quantum physics. Well, no points for guessing what this game is. And if you're looking for a kid-friendly example, we always have Pokemon. Well, some of you may say, games, movies, I don't have time for that kind of lowly pastime. I'm just addicted to social media. I read online articles and I watch YouTube videos. But things only get weirder over there. In YouTube, you have channels who use quantum physics to explain magic. One time, Facebook even tried to sell me this bio-quantum energy pendant, which is supposed to, I quote, resonate with my quantum energy, whatever that's supposed to mean. And then there are countless people online who claim that they somehow unlock the secret of the universe because they are enlightened by quantum physics. Oh, no, 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 say some of you. Social media is too low level for my taste. Me? I read the real thing. I read books. Well, sure. But if you flip through some of the popular science books, you'll see quotes like no one knows quantum physics or quantum physics is just so strange and detached from common sense. Stuff like that. It is then no surprise when people have the wrong idea of what quantum physics really is. There's this one time when I was just talking to a friend of mine. Well, I'm not going to tell you his name because I'm a professional and I'm not holding any grudges at all. Well, Dave asked me, hey man, what do you do? Oh, I research on quantum mechanics. Oh, how about you? Well, I am a civil engineer doing something, you know, closer to real life. You get what I mean? Of course, as any self-respecting physics student, I destroyed him in my mind three hours later. The point is, there are so many quantum around us nowadays, it is just hard to even determine which ones are the correct ones and which ones are the wrong ones. And some are very, very wrong. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy all this attention to physics, but when the audience get the wrong idea about quantum physics, it is not really a good thing. So here I am right now telling you what I should have said to Dave, that quantum physics is real. Quantum physics has real life consequences and applications. Quantum has given us a lot of modern technologies and here is why. To do that, we must go back to the beginning at the end of the 19th century. By the end of 19th century, physicists already know three major subfields of physics. Classical mechanics, then only called mechanics because we don't know it's going to be classical beforehand, you know. Electromagnetism and thermodynamics. At that point in time, these are the only things that, needed, that are needed to describe almost everything we know in physics. Hence, physicists at the time has a huge confidence that all the laws of physics are known. For example, we have Lord Kelvin, someone who contributed a lot to thermodynamics, said, in 1900, the year 1900, at an address in the British Association for the Advancement of Science, that there is nothing new to be discovered in physics now. All that remains is more and more precise measurement. Of course, he also said that heavier than air flying machines are impossible, so I'll let you decide how much you want to believe in them. On the other hand, Albert Michelson, the Michelson in the michelson morley experiment, also said that the more important fundamental laws and facts of physical science have all been discovered, and that the chances that a new theory that can supplant classical physics is very slim. And this is a bit ironic because the michelson morley experiment was one of the big inspiration for special relativity, but that's another story for another day. Anyway, the moral of the story is never be too cocky because you will only embarrass yourself. 
Now, the important question is, is it true that all physics phenomena known at the time is solved by classical physics? No. And here's the first one. Imagine you are a blacksmith hitting a red hot iron. What is the first thing that you will notice? Well, the first thing that you should notice is that you should always wear your gloves, aprons and boots because safety first. Well, okay, the second thing you would see is that the iron grows, glows red when it is hot. In fact, based on the color of the iron, we can tell how hot it is. Depending on the temperature of the object, it will give a very signature glow. This is called the black body radiation. So this is nothing new at the time, and the spectrum of the glow is well detected in experiments at the time. We know how it is supposed to look like, as shown over here. However, if we calculate the spectrum from classical physics, this is the curve that we get. And do you know what is the implication of this curve? It means that every blacksmith in the world will be fried to death. This is called the ultraviolet catastrophe. In fact, this even applies to us, although we glow in the infrared region. So this is the first problem that classical physics encounter. A second problem is discovered by Heinrich Hertz in the year 1887. He discovered the photoelectric effect. And let me simplify this experiment a little bit. Suppose you have a circuit with a spark gap, with a gap in the middle. Normally, electricity does not flow through a gap. However, Hertz discovered that if you shine light onto the gap, you get a spark. This is called the photoelectric effect because, you know, light causes electricity. While it is easy to see that light induces electricity, it is much harder to explain how it happened. In fact, a lot of the qual qualitative behavior of the photoelectric effect cannot be explained using classical electromagnetis electromagnetism. So this is the second major problem at the time. Of course, as I mentioned before, the Michelson-Morley experiment posed as the third major problem, which eventually leads to special relativity. However, since this is called the Q-Camp, we are not going to talk about it here. Perhaps someday when we have something called the GR chem, then we'll talk about that. One last interesting thing in the 19th century is physicists don't believe in the existence of atoms. But, but I hear you say, I thought John Dalton already has a full atomic theory in 1808. And you would be right. The atomic theory has already been proven useful for calculations. However, because physics, physics, physicists insist that everything has to be measurable, they consider atoms as just something that's useful, abstract, yeah, some useful abstract concept for calculation and not something that's real. But at the time, there's the phys this physicist called Ludwig Boltzmann, who believed that atoms are real. And based on the existence of atoms itself, he in om invented almost the entire field of statistical mechanics, and it can explain most of thermodynamics. However, physicists at the time shunned him, ignore him, and eventually in the year 1906, he took his own, own life. And two years later, in 1908, Jean Perron validated the atomic theory experimentally, and physicists begin to accept the atomic theory. Well, the moral of the story is this. If you ever feel like saying goodbye to the world, wait a couple of years. Then you can tell them, I told you so. Well, while the physicist at the time was a bit arrogant, advancement of science cannot be stopped by mere arrogance. As more is known and as technology improves, we can say that advancement is inevitable. So here we are now in 1900s. In the year 1900, Max Planck tried to tackle the black body radiation problem. Do you remember when you were young and you were trying to solve mazes? We always try to start from the start because that's what start means. Until one day you realize that, hey, I can actually start from the end and sometimes it's simpler to solve it that way. Yeah, that's what Planck did, okay? Since you cannot get the black body spectrum starting from the known theory, he started from the experimental curve. He stared at the spectrum for a long period of time, and eventually he guessed the equation that described the black body spectrum. The equation agrees well with what is observed in experiments, but there's just one problem. The equation implies that light behaves like particles. Well, since the young double split experiment, light is well known to be waves. Well, duh, we call them electromagnetic waves, not electromagnetic particles. So this is directly opposite to what we, we know so far about light at the time. Despite his reservations, he still published his guest equation. However, he emphasized that these light particles are just a convenience and called this small packet of light quanta. This is how quantum mechanics gets its name. 
The keyword here is small. So whenever you see a self-help program that promises you quantum leap, yeah, in your growth or whatever, don't waste your time. Anyway, not everyone ignores this result. A certain clerk in patent office took the result seriously. This guy is Albert Einstein. So in the year 1905, Einstein considered the photoelectric effect. He said, hey, maybe Plang is right and light really does behave like a particle. Well, this revolutionary approach managed to solve all the problems that we have in the photoelectric effect, as I mentioned before. With one problem solved comes another bigger one. So is light wave or particle? Are they contradictory? After multiple tries and experiments, they confirmed that sometimes light do behave like uh, particles and sometimes they do behave like waves. Either one of the description just couldn't cut it. With no other way of conciliation in 1909, we are forced to accept the wave-particle duality of light. On the other hand, since the atomic theory is widely accepted at this time, by now, people have tried to do more experiments on atoms. In particular, in the year 1911, Ernest Rutherford discovered the atomic nucleus. Based on his experiments, Rutherford proposed that the electrons orbit around the nucleus like the Earth orbits around the Sun. But there is a problem with this model. The atom is not stable. According to electrodynamics, the orbiting electron will give off radiation and so will slowly spiral into the nucleus. So in 1913, Niels Bohr came to the rescue, learning from Planck. Instead of focusing on the prediction of classical physics, he started from the end. He took the stability of the atom as an assumption and proposed that electron can only exist in certain discrete level of energy. When light with the same energy as the level difference comes, the electron transits from a lower level to a higher level. On the other hand, when the electron comes down from a higher energy level to a lower energy level, it gives off light. So let me ask you this. If you have a problem and you cannot solve it, then someone came over and say, let's mix the problem as the assumption problem solved. Will you believe him? Well, of course not. People at the time did not believe him either. One of the few people who actually believed him was Einstein. But then Bohr's physical intuition was so good that this ad hoc atomic model is actually partially correct. How correct is this model? You ask, well, you know how in chemistry you have the flame tests where you can identify the elements based on the color for the flames? No, well, it's explained. You know about the atomic spectra? Well, it's also explained by this model. In fact, have you ever wondered how we can determine the elements in the stars that is so far away from us? This is exactly how. We identify elements from other stars in the galaxy by looking at their atomic spectra because they are like the fingerprints of elements. Since Einstein believed in Bohr, he worked on the Bohr's atomic model. We know now that the electron absorbs light to go to the higher energy level, and we know that the electrons from the higher level will come down and gives off light. Now the question is, what happens when the electron is at the higher energy level and light comes along? Well, Einstein postulated that since photons are such good friends, the electron will come down to the lower level and the light will leave together. The light will be in the same phase, same direction, and the same color. This is called the stimulated emission, which was proposed in the year 1917. In fact, this is all is needed for lasers. What is the full name for lasers? Well, it stands for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. I wonder how long it took them to create such a cool acronym. Well, with that, we have all the concepts for a laser. However, it took some time before technology and experiments allow us to create the first functioning laser, which is in the year 1960. Nowadays, laser has been an integral part of our lives. So what are the applications of lasers in our everyday life? We use them in laser pointers, laser mouse, laser printers. We need them for Blu-ray disc, and we even use them for surgeries, like for Lasix spinal surgeries. So every year in QCAM, I would ask this exact same question. Okay, and one year I was asking this same question as usual. So here's how it goes. So everyone, can you give me an example of lasers in everyday life? Then there's this one very eager student who yells, laser cooling, atom trapping. Gosh, what kind of everyday life do you have, man? Anyway, of all the applications of lasers, you know what is the most interesting one? There are, there's this plan to build space lasers, actually. In the year 1983, 
U.S. President Ronald Reagan proposed the Strategic Defense Initiative to protect USA. One of his plans is to build space lasers to protect America from incoming missiles. But because it is too expensive and too technical and don't really make any practical sense, it got cancelled in the end. But, you know, wouldn't it be cool and terrifying at the same time that we have space lasers? Well, but I digress. Now let us return to the year 1917. Bohr's atomic model shows that in the, same, in the small scale, energy levels are discrete. But do you think energy level is the only discrete thing in the atom? Definitely not. Imagine this. If you have a magnetic field pointing downwards, as you see over here, and you send an electron in like this, will the electron deflect upwards or downwards? Well, if you remember your high school physics, you may guess that, well, the electron will stay in the same plane as shown over here. But the answer is no. In the year 1922, Otto Stern and Walter Gerlach performed the same experiment and he found that the particle actually deviated. That's not the most surprising thing. What's more surprising is that they only found two spots. There is nothing in the middle. So in 1925, George Ellenbeck and Samuel Goudsmith assumed that this is because electrons spin like a ballet dancer and cause them to behave like mini magnets. Well, naturally they call this spin. And since there are two spots found in the experiment just now, physicists just assume they are spin up and spin down. However, this picture is wrong. We now know that this behavior has nothing to do with electron spinning, but it is just an inherent property of the electron itself. But then we still call it spin nowadays because the name is just stuck. Anyway, now, the more is known about the microscopic world, the more likely we are able to discover the inner workings of or laws for quantum physics. So in the year 1925, the same year spin was proposed, Werner Heisenberg found a mathematical description of quantum mechanics. He uses matrix to describe quantum mechanics. Well, not this matrix, this matrix. Because this formalism uses matrix, it is also called, surprise, matrix mechanics. The mathematical structure of matrix is useful since it nicely suits the discrete nature of things. Using this formalism, Heisenberg also found something disturbing his math implies that we can never know the position and momentum to arbitrary precisions simultaneously. Let us compare this with classical mechanics. Okay, So in classical mechanics, we know that the position of the runner and we can see how fast he's running. So both position and momentum of the runner is well defined. However, what matrix mechanics says is that if you know how fast he is running, you cannot know exactly where the runner is. This is called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And this is earth shattering because it is entirely different from what people know since Newton, where position and momentum can be known to arbitrary precision at the same time. And from knowing exactly the position and momentum, we can predict precisely how the object will move until the end of time. The uncertainty principle just implies that this deterministic viewpoint of the world can never be attained. The theoretical foundations of the world is shattering before our very eyes. And you think this already blows your mind? Wait, there's more. Remember the wave-particle duality of light? Where light waves behave like particles? Well, why must light wave have the special treatment? Why can't particles behave like waves too? This is discrimination. So in 1924, Louis de Broglie demand equality for both waves and particles and propose that matter can behave like waves too, called matter waves. In other words, he took away the light from this statement and simply said that, well, wave-particle duality is general. He, we, he even found the equation for wavelengths of matter. So now an electron has a corresponding wavelength. And sure enough, in the year 1927, Clinton Davison and Lester Germer confirmed the wave nature of particles by demonstrating electron diffraction. In other words, de Broglie was right. But before his hypothesis was even proven correct, Someone has so much faith in De Broglie's theory that he developed De Broglie's idea even further in the year 1926. He is Erwin Schrodinger. Now, if everything behaves like wave, then surely there must be a wave equation to describe all this wave, right? So in the year 1926, Schrodinger wrote down a wave equation for all matter, and this is called the Schrodinger equation. Now, the Schrodinger equation predicts the correct hydrogen line spectrum, so we can be sure that it is correct. Since this approach uses the wave equation, we also call this formalism, surprise again, wave mechanics. Now here's the problem. 
we have Heisenberg's matrix mechanics and we have Schrodinger's wave mechanics, who is correct. It turns out that, you know, they are both correct because they are just both two sides of the same coin. And who do you think showed that they are equal? Well, it is Schrodinger. So now there you go. We have all the basic laws of quantum physics spelled out. We are done with all these imaginary things. It's not real whatsoever, and we never heard of this anymore. And we all live happily ever after the end. In your dreams, maybe. Now that we have the basic laws of quantum physics, it is time to apply them and see what we can exploit from them. We are only getting started. So let's start with the wave particle duality. Well, how can we use that? Let's recap on microscope which we learned in high school, I hope. Now, since light behaves like waves, if the object you are observing is too small, it begins to diffract. Then this is the smallest you can observe. In technical terms, this is the diffraction limit. How do you think we can circumvent this problem? Well, by using shorter and shorter wavelength. Then you remember about wave particle duality. Since electron, electrons are waves, why not we build a microscope using electrons? And so the first electron microscope is born in the year 1932, invented by Ernst Ruska and Max Snow. What is so good about this electron microscope anyway? Turns out electrons have a much shorter wavelength than light, and it allows us to look at things smaller than an optical microscope can. Here are some examples of uh, electron microscope images. To compare the performance of optical microscope with electron microscope, the best optical microscope can see up to 200 nanometers but the best electron microscope can see up to 0.1 nanometers. So you see how much better an electron microscope is compared to the normal optical microscope. Can we do better than that? Of course we can. To do that, we have to remind ourselves of another property of waves. Well, remember from high school that when we have total internal reflection, all light reflect and nothing will be refracted, right? Well, it turns out this is not exactly true. If you put another lens close enough to where the light hits, you will see that very faint light actually passes through the second lens. In classical wave theory, this is called the evanescent wave. Basically, what happens is that wave will leak through a barrier. If electrons behave like waves, it also means that it can behave like that too. But in the quantum context, we call it quantum tunneling. Using quantum tunneling properties in the year 1981, Gerd Binnick and Heinrich Rohrer invented the scanning tunneling microscope. This machine is so amazing that we can actually see individual atoms. In fact, its best performance is 0.01 nanometer, even smaller than that of an electron microscope. Not only that, this machine also allows us to manipulate surfaces atom by atom. Of course, this has a lot of applications in material science, but personally, I think, it is cooler that people actually use it to make the world's smallest movie, which is called The Boy and the Atom, which you can check out afterwards. With that, we can finally observe individual atoms and no one can ever doubt that atoms exist anymore. I guess I just wanted to say, rest in peace, Boltzmann. You have been avenged. Now, quantum physics also allows us to create one of the scariest things in the entire world the atomic bomb. You cannot cheat me, Alex. I read books too. The working principle of atomic bombs is based on radioactivity, and radioactivity is discovered by Henry Becquerel in 1896. Since then, the development in radioactivity is done in chemistry and has nothing to do with quantum physics at all. So, no. The atomic bomb has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. Well, let me tell you this very, very clearly. You are right. Radioactivity is discovered way before quantum physics. Even though quantum physics explains most of chem chemistry anyway, I won't go as far as Ernest Rutherford, you know, the guy who discovered the atomic nucleus. Basically, he said that all science is either physics or STEM collecting. Well, I won't tell you that because I value my life. But what I will say is this. Quantum physics provides a quantitative way of predicting what we can expect from radioactivity. And this is important if you want to design an atomic bomb. Why? Because without quantitative prediction, we can only do it by trial and error. And we cannot afford to do trial and error because materials like uranium is not that abundant and they are expensive. 
even if you have unlimited supply of uranium, can you imagine designing the atomic bomb by trial and error? Um, Commander, I'm here to report that we have just failed a trial of the atomic bomb. No matter, we can try again. But sir, we can't. Our country was destroyed by the bombs in the process. We are all killed. We are actually ghosts now. Oh. I mean, if that actually happened, the Cold War will have entirely different meaning of the word cold. So yeah, quantum physics helped ended World War II. As we are near the end of World War II, we also know more and more about atoms. So in the year 1945, Isidore Rabi is observing how electrons transit between energy levels. In particular, he can make electrons oscillate between two energy levels in the atom. And he observed that these oscillations are actually very, very regular. So he thought, why not we use this as a timekeeping machine? So this is the first conception of atomic clock. Eventually, the first accurate atomic clock is invented in the year 1955 using the cesium-133 uh, atom. These clocks are so accurate that we actually use them to define what one second actually means. But you don't have to be afraid because, you know, they won't explode. Then you ask, where do we use such accurate timing? I hear you ask. Well, in GPS, in order for GPS to know accurately where you are, it needs to be very precise in time. In fact, it has to be so precise that it is measured in nanoseconds. If the precision is off, then GPS may actually think that you are in the bottom of the ocean right now as we speak. But compared to the most accurate atomic clock we have right now, this is actually just child's play. Of course, those of you who are well versed in general relativity, we know that GPS also involves some ideas from special relativity in order for it to work properly. Well, but that's the story for another time. So far, I've only mentioned how quantum physics is applied to atoms and electrons, but it can do so much more. After all, what is a solid if not a collection of atoms? So naturally, quantum physics apply to solids too. And this entire field is called solid state physics. Well, there are of course a lot of development in solid state physics, but one of the most important invention in solid state physics is this, the transistor. Let me tell you the story behind its invention, okay? It is a story that involves three people, William Shockley, Walter Bertain, and John Bardeen. You can think of them as the boss, the experimentalist, and the theorist. Now, before we can talk about the invention of transistor, let's talk about the historical background. We know, we, we know now that transistors are electronic switches and amplifiers, but do you know what they use before that? They use vacuum tubes. Don't get me wrong, vacuum tubes are important because they are the only thing that functions as switches and amplifiers at the time, but it does have its downsides. So it's big, it needs time to heat up in order to produce electrons, it needs extra power to heat up, it's heavy and it's fragile. So working with vacuum tubes can be a pain. Can you imagine you need to turn on the TV a couple of hours before the program you want to watch? Well, but still, the world's first computer is built using these vacuum tubes. It's called the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computator, uh, and Computer, ENIAC. Now, ENIAC is a huge beast in that it feeds an entire basement. Its main purpose is to calculate trajectory of missiles. How long do you think it would take it to calculate the trajectory of a single missile? 30 seconds. Nowadays, a single microchip so much smaller than INIA can already do way more than that. I mean, look at your smartphones. Moreover, because of how big it is, it is very prone to errors. And here's how it probably goes. L Let's start calculating. Wait, something's wrong. Report, sir, we found a bug. This, this is impossible. I've checked the code relentlessly and I'm sure there can never be bugs. Is this a sign that I'm getting old? Is it time for me to retire? I guess my time is up. Um, sir, I meant we literally found a bug in the circuits. Yep. Well, vacuum tubes are useful. They are not the best to work with. So Shockley wants to tackle this problem. With his knowledge of quantum physics and solid state physics, he managed to design an electronic switch based on semiconductors, which is what we call transistors nowadays. Being the boss and all, Shockley ordered Bardeen and Bertain to execute his designs. 
However, Shockley's design did not consider some of the subtle effects of solid state physics, and by itself, it didn't work. So Bardeen and Bertain spent a lot of time on it, and eventually, in the year 1947, they invented the first transistor ever, which looks like this. Well, I know what you're going to say. This does not look anything like the transistor we know and love nowadays. But chill, it's the, the, the transistor that we know is going to come soon. Now that we have invented the, now that they have invented the transistor, Bardin and Bertain quickly tried to file for a patent. In the meantime, Shockley told them, put my name on the patent. Well, we would love to if you tell us where your contributions are. Well, there, here you go, satisfied. Now put my name onto the patent. Nope. Naturally, Shockley was really upset by this because he is the boss. So he consulted a lawyer and asked the patent lawyer to put his name into the patent. After some considerations, the lawyer said no as well. Now, Shockley is very angry about this because he thinks that the transistor is his own idea. So what happens is that Shockley began to work on an entirely different design of the transistor with his team. But he made sure to keep Bardeen and Bertain out of the loop. Feeling bullied, Bardeen and Bertain eventually left the group. Meanwhile, Shockley managed to invent a new design for the transistor, which is the transistor that we are all familiar with nowadays. And do you know what is the first thing they use the transistor on? Not radios, not TV, not watches. The first application of transistor is hearing aids. Back in the day, you know, when people use vacuum tubes, we have to carry a box around if we want to use hearing aids. I mean, it makes you feel like Iron Man, yeah? You can put it in the pocket or in, pin it in front of your shirt like Iron Man, but either way, it's just inconvenient, okay? Of course, since then, transistor has been applied to many other electronics, like portable radios, CD players, DVD players, computers, laptops, TVs, phones, whatever electronic appliances you can think of, right? So there will be transistors everywhere, okay? Transistor pave way to make electronics smaller and smaller. It is the precursor to the invention of microchips. So transistor is what defines our modern world, modern world. And Shockley only managed to design the transistor because he has a good grasp of quantum physics and solid state physics. Okay, so that's the history of transistors. Now, do you remember John Bardeen? Because he was bullied and boycotted by Shockley, uh, Bardeen chose to leave the group shortly after. And in the year 1957, together with Leon Cooper and John Schrieffer, they explained the phenomenon called superconductivity. What are superconductors? So we learn in school that conductors have resistance, right? And because conductors have resistance, they give out heat when you pass current through the wire, okay? But when the temperature is cold enough, conductors suddenly lose their resistance. We call these conductors without resistance, superconductors. And because they don't have resistance, they will not generate heat regardless of the current passing through. This phenomenon is explained in 1957. Well, in fact, they could have explained superconductivity in 1956, but do you know why it got delayed by one year? It's because Bardin was busy accepting the Nobel Prize in physics. And because of this, the three of them received the Nobel Prize in physics in 1972. So Bardin is the only person to be awarded uh, the Nobel Prize in physics twice so far. Well, hold on a second. I hear you trying to tell me. You're trying to cheat me. I read books, you know. So I know superconductors are actually discovered by Heike Kemmerling honors in the year 1911 in Mercury at about 4 Kelvin temperature. So quantum physics has nothing to do with the discovery of superconductors, and we could have used them without any problem. Well, you're right. Superconductivity is known very, way earlier, but the explanation using quantum physics allow us to design better superconductors at higher temperatures. Though doing it by trial and error is definitely safer than in the case of atomic bombs, I give you that. So what can a superconductor do? Well, because it does not have any resistance, wires do not heat up and they, there will be no energy loss by heating. So we can use superconductors to create strong magnetic fields. For example, maglev trains, which stands for magnetic levitation trains. It is also used to create magnetic fields for magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. MRI works by using strong magnetic fields to probe the spins in the water molecules in our body. 
And this allows us to look inside the body without actually cutting people out. And this is very important for medical imaging. At this point, you probably have one dying question you would like to ask. If electrons are waves, then why have we never found half an electron before? Why do we always find one whole electron? Think of the electron diffraction experiment I showed earlier. Even with the diffraction pattern, you see dots, but you never see something like half a dot. Why is that? Well, this is a prob puzzling problem by itself. But in the year 1926, Max Born came to the rescue. Since we never see half of an electron before, naturally, electron itself is not entirely a wave. In fact, he proposed that the wave function actually describes the probability, probability distribution of the electron. This will explain why we always see one whole electron, but still have a wave equation. Well, that is a shattering. Do you know what it means? Think of the double slit experiment. We know that for light, we get a diffraction pattern because of the superposition of two waves. But for electrons, we know that if we cover one of the slit, the electrons will have a Gaussian distribution as shown. If you cover the other slit, it will have the same distribution but shifted. So naturally, if we cover both of the slits, well, nothing happens because you cover both of the slits. But if you open both of the slits, if the electron were to come out of one of the slit at a time, we just add the two waves together and we get another distribution which does not have a diffraction pattern. The fact that we do observe a diffraction pattern means that the electron must have gone through both slits at the same time. Well, that's not exactly true because electrons don't actually go through both slits at the same time, but rather it's in a new state by itself, new state of uncertainty. We are just uncertain which slit it went to and we can never be certain which slit it went through. And we use the same name to describe this new state of uncertainty. We call it the superposition. Well, naturally, not everyone is happy about the probabilistic nature of things. One of this person is Erwin Schrodinger, which you remember as the one who developed wave mechanics. He discussed about the thought experiment, which you probably have heard it a lot of times before, which is called the Schrodinger's cat. It was originally proposed as a paradox for quantum physics, but imagine, imagine him giving a talk on Schrodinger's cat nowadays. This is probably what's going to happen. Well, so the cat is in the state of half dead and half alive. It's totally crazy, right? Yep, judging by how people react to Schrodinger's cat nowadays, I think Schrodinger may not be exactly happy about that. Another big challenger is Albert Einstein. In fact, in the year 1920s and 1930s, Bohr and Einstein will always have this debate. Um, well, there's some technical difficulties. My slide is gone for some reasons, <laughs> so no animations for now. In fact, in 1920s, Bohr and Einstein will always have this debate. Einstein attacking quantum physics while Bohr defending it. Oh, every time, Einstein will propose a paradox of quantum physics, but Bohr always manages to find a flaw in the paradox. And there's this one time that Einstein proposed a paradox that Bohr solved using general relativity a theory that's created by Einstein himself. I know, ironic, right? Which I'm sure you've definitely learned in the imaginary GR chem that we've talked about. So despite having these heavy debates, Bohr and Einstein still remain great friends. So that's really friendship goes. So we are in this ironic situation where Einstein, one of the founding father, founding members of the quantum theory is trying to find problems with quantum physics. He would always lose to Bohr in these debates until the year 1935, when he, along with Boris Podolsky and Nathan Rosen, came up with the EPR paradox. Wait, hold it. If it is called EPR paradox, why did I put Rosen in the middle of the picture instead of Podolsky? Well, that's because Einstein does not really like Podolsky. Anyway, what is the EPR paradox? The very short version of this is that according to the quantum theory, particles can have correlations with each other. Say if they have opposite spins, but if the particles are far away from each other, they will behave probabilistically individually. And if you compare the results later, you'll find that they still follow the same correlation that we have before. How then do the particles communicate with each other so that they know what the other particle is? 
We call this long distance correlation entanglement. Einstein then concludes that the probabilistic theory of quantum mechanics is incomplete, and there must be something hidden that allows us to predict what their individual spins are to begin with. Well, there's no resolution to the EPR paradox because it is a concept and there is nothing measurable to compare it with either, until the year 1964, when John Bell find a way to quantitatively decide if Einstein, Einstein's idea that quantum mechanics is incomplete is the correct one, or if quantum mechanics is actually correct. If Einstein's idea is correct, then there is um, information hidden in the particle itself that lets us predict what the spin actually are. Then, then they will have to obey something called the Bell's inequality. According to quantum physics though, for specific states, it violates this Bell's inequality. This then provides a quantitative way of settling the score once and for all. So who do you think won? So in the year 1981, Elaine Espec conducted the experiment and found that quantum mechanics is in fact correct. Well, shoot. This means that the world is inherently probabilistic. Not only that, the strange correlation between electrons at a distance is real. So there you go. Quantum mechanics is not something imaginary, but reality. As strange as quantum physics is, it still changed the entire world drastically. And do you think by now everything that can be done in quantum is done and that there is nothing more for you to do in quantum mechanics? You are wrong. There are still a lot more to do. Say, for example, in the year 1980, Alexei Ekimov invented quantum dots. Quantum dots are particles that can give off specific wavelength of light depending on the size of the nanoparticles. And recently we have seen its application in quantum dot displays. Here's an example. Can you see the difference between the two? Don't you see the huge difference between the conventional display and the quantum dot display? Well, I certainly can because my laptop screen is not quantum dot display. Well, furthermore, there are more things to come in the future. For example, quantum metrology, where we use quantum properties to help us have higher precision when we measure things or quantum cryptography, where you will exploit entanglement to provide safer communications. Well, only if you use it correctly anyway. Perhaps the most popular concept we see nowadays is quantum computers. It is an idea proposed by Richard Feynman. He thinks that one should use quantum mechanical systems to simulate quantum mechanical systems. And sure enough, it evolved into the idea of quantum computers. The basic idea is that in classical computers, we have either one or zero, which we call bits, you know, binary digits. But if we use quantum systems, say an electron, we can have states like a superposition of electrons spin up and spin down. We call this qubits or quantum bits. And for certain problems, quantum computers can solve them faster than any classical computers can. In short, there are still more things to come. There are, of course, a lot of topics that I did not cover. Maybe there are some of your favorites that I didn't mention. If you have any complaints about my omissions, well, please feel free to complain to my bosses in this camp, you know, Angelina. In fact, I've received many criticism before that my talk is not technical enough because they didn't see any equations. Well, that's not the point of this presentation. The point of my presentation is this. Quantum physics is discovered, not invented. Quantum physics behaves strange because nature is strange, not because physicists like to be hip, you know. Many brilliant minds have tried really, really hard to resist quantum physics like Einstein and Schrodinger, but quantum physics triumphed in the end. Second, quantum physics started from an investigation of problems that were deemed too small at the time. And for its own sake, no one at the time knew that it would have such a big impact around us. They do it because of their curiosity. And of course, quantum physics is as real as things can get. If I had included math, I would have defeated its purpose, right? So I will leave those very difficult discussion of mathematics to the rest of the camp, right? So wash my hands off this. While I focus my tech talk on technology, quantum physics certainly have larger influences in other fields. For example, the entire Silicon Valley, a famous technolo technological hub, is started by the transistor business. That's why it's called Silicon Valley. So quantum physics have a huge impact in economics. It also influenced the field of philosophy, whereby we have something called quantum logic. Well, please don't ask me to explain it because I don't really understand what's going on there. You know, personally, I think that the entertainment sector owes us a lot of thanks. 
Because without quantum mechanics, how would the writers of TV shows, movies, or books even conclude their story? They would write themselves to a dead end. I'm pretty sure in the writer's room, when they are in the dead end, they would just throw the word quantum and everything is solved. Cough, cough, end game, cough, cough. Well, too bad Game of Thrones can't use that. So that's the end of my presentation. I hope you have a better understanding of appreciation of quantum physics. Thank you very much.